Years ago, I was in graduate school in art. We were walking across the street, and we looked down, and Margie saw the pencil and said, it's magic. How many wonderful drawings are in this pencil? To start off today, when we go to these lectures, I often just sit there, and sometimes I draw. I can't draw in these rolling chairs, by the way. <laughs> but, but that I sit there, and I, I get to be very passive. I want you to be active. I want everyone to take 30 seconds, let's we make it one minute, <coughs> to do a blind drawing of one of these light fixtures. Do not look at your paper. Look at the light fixture and find out where your pencil is on the paper. One minute. Okay, thanks. If you would, in the upper right corner, Either put A if you think of yourself as an architect or artist, and S if you think of yourself as a scientist. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take these further and see what, what happens later. That's the top one. Top right. <laughs> if you would, when you leave, if you would, just leave on the table as you, as you leave. <laughs> On the, on the way here, we landed, David and I did, and Lawrence picked us up, a wonderful man, and we started talking about food. And Lawrence loves to make gumbo. He makes gumbo for his family, which is like 30 or 40 people. And we had this wonderful discussion about how you make the roux and what color the roux is. David didn't know. And Lawrence held his hand up and he said like this, not like mine, his was a little browner than mine, <laughs> kind of a tan. And then we started talking about all the ingredients. Lawrence didn't know that it's supposed to have okra in it. <laughs> <laughs> Crab, sausage, and so forth. I think the people that put this together <laughs> made the roof, the roof for uh, Pardon me, for gumbo here. The roux came from all of us as we bring to it a care about drawing, whether it's an intellectual care based on the scientist or the care of drawing, the care of making. I feel like everybody draws, and I'm very suspicious of words. I tend to kind of agree with what supposedly Einstein says thoughts die the moment they become words images in my view do not I've drawn my whole life but only until about I didn't really understand drawing from actual things from people from skeletons until much later the one thing that I, I've always worked with is the notion of underlying structure, underlying order. We come to understand something as an architect or as an artist or as a writer when we understand that underlying structure. We search for that. And I find I have to make many images as I go through. But fundamental to the image of drawing or to drawing to me is the mark. Then we have the tool and the tool hits the surface. I, I struggle with my friend back here with her, his uh, computer as he's drawing on his computer because it doesn't have that tax, tactile quality. The tactile quality you just felt with that, that uh, paper that you had, wonderful paper. And also drawing is not, to me, totally analytical, but it has an emotional quality to it or it can have an emotional quality. When it has a fullness to it that pulls you in, makes you part of it. To me, it, that's kind of the emotional drawing and then more of the brain where we start working kind of analytically with moving things back and forth. I make sketches, not unlike Frank Harmon, my sketches go a little further and I usually finish them, but they may be sitting in the breakfast room or working towards finishing a box of candy. 
<laughs> or the, the leftover breakfast plate. And by doing this, I feel like I've come to a new understandings of how things go together. The apple, the little cup on the striped cloth, the salt shaker. I spent two years drawing these salt shakers in cafes when I was in graduate school, drinking coffee and drawing salt shakers and sugar, sugar shakers. The other thing that just draw, you know, I was talking to Kelly, just draw. I don't care what you draw, but things like a vacuum cleaner to me is very rich. Or the little pencil sharpener that's in there. The bike, which is a challenge to draw, but it's around us. There are things that we can take and through the pencil put on paper and do something with. Draw to understand the underlying structure. Uh, I continue to draw. I go to a studio usually in paint on Mondays. I have a studio in my house. I'm finally getting finished. And then we, a group of us goes out in the country one night a week and draws from a model. This is a little sketch by my wife who was not trained in the arts. The, we, I find that when I go out and start working with these models, you know, I'm, it takes several weeks for me to get kind of toned in, tuned in with them, where you know where your pencil is on the paper corresponds with what you're looking at. Drawing to me is a way to a, another world of magic, and the magic is through this magic stick right here. This magic stick sliding over that paper. Drawing is extremely important to me. It liberates and leads to a kind of insight unknown in the world of words. We live in a world of images and use the pencil to find order, pursue solutions, practical and aesthetic issues. We doodle. Yeah, I see all kind of people that are doodling around in different ways. It is a productive way to be. A productive way to be. The blind drawing, to me, was one of the, is one of the magic things, where you look at the, the fixture, you look at the base, and you begin to draw without looking at the paper. And there's a power and a strength that comes to that that can under, 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 undercoat that which you can then develop into more, more drawings and paintings. My wife would still loves me, even though I do these drawings of her, uh, where we, we begin to look at the person and do the drawings and then do it again and then do it again. And then in time, it may become something else. In a way, those are pretty good to me. This is probably a little more accurate or a little more mysterious to draw. If we were to draw every day, and I don't care what you draw, I believe you would see a different world opening up to you. It, back in 73, I had just gotten out of the service, trying to figure out what to do, went into graduate school, and started a, 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 a graduate program in drawing. The first thing we started with was the skeleton. But you could, this was not an analytical kind of thing. I was not supposed to put the names on the bones, thank goodness, because I started medical school and I couldn't remember the parts of the frog, which was a pretty good reason why I shouldn't become a doctor. <laughs> I could draw the parts of the frog. So that we, we were doing drawings that not only illustrated how different parts went together, but then tried to make an aesthetic piece out of that. Clearly, when we talk about drawing, we're starting with the eye. We can start with our own eye. We can look at other eyes. We can look at how people talk about drawing eyes. But it's, to me, as we begin working on these, we come to a better understanding of our own body. This, to me, has ramifications in other ways. 
to me, and I know there's some doctors here, they can probably understand this hip better than I can, but I do, I understand it better now after doing the drawing. The knees, the, the hip, the foot, the way it goes together. And as I get older, I have problems with these different things, so I can go look at these drawings I've made. And then it can come together into a little sketch. The foot and the hand, two of two, the wonderful, difficult things to draw. Muscles, ligaments. But here we are looking at the underlying structure of us as we move about. This is parts of us. Mitchell's arm, or a more developed sketch, or drawing, I think, uh, where we begin to use the figure, and the figure begins to move. Light and shadow. Uh, the full model, which I must say, I, I really love working with full models. I've had some very beautiful young women that are boring, especially if they've used silicone. Very boring to draw, but a woman like this is full, and, and here's a, a little Lucian, a drawing of Lucian of Freud, of a rather heavy woman. It's like hills and mountains and valleys. And then just a quick sketch, but I think he, I can't do the quick sketch until I have done a lot of the preparatory stuff in my life. That was a self-portrait a long time ago. <laughs> then if we can look at the animals, the skeletons they have. The, the wonder, think of the, of the elephant skeleton with his tusk. One of the most marvelous animals I've, that I ever did do drawings of was the armadillo, a much hated a little creature in the south and tears up your garden and, and, and the greens on the golf course. But it is endoskeleton and exoskeleton. And the frog. The frog, until I did this, I thought was a piece of gelatin. <laughs> but these wonderful skeletons and how the pieces come together lets us understand our world and that which surrounds us. And the most difficult to me, to the doctors, the most difficult to me is understanding this rib cage and how you get the, the lungs and the ribs and all that together in there. Shoulders, you get your rotator cuff, that's, it, it's like that, and there is no socket. Then the spine that comes through us, that's the structure that carries us. Just a quick sketch, this is one of the ones we did it in, out of the studio. Then I begin, this is, all these things happen simultaneously in this little show that I'll show them sequentially. We begin to look at, I've done, been to Europe many times, lived there for a couple of years, uh, and would always go in these uh, chapels and do sketches. This was actually done in Christ Chapel at Oxford when there was a concert going. And to begin looking at that, hearing the music and then seeing the structure that surrounds us. Go into a little uh, Welsh building museum, trusses from medieval days. Here is the medieval barn in Stratford-on-Avon. We went to a play and left my son, who was three years old there. Uh, the people there at bed and breakfast were gonna feed him. They gave him beans and bread. He's never let me forget that. <laughs> Then we go to the, to the gallery at, at Fitzwilliam Museum, where you begin, as architects, we begin looking at it to understand how the structure works, how the light comes in, how the space begins to be developed. And then maybe we look back at the skeleton, that those ribs that parallel the ribs of Christ Church, so that we can have our linkage and our, our underlying order. The Temple of Hera at Hastum, where we begin looking at the light, 
the solidity of this on his plinths in, in the plains and how it articulated in space, object in space. Clearly in, in architecture we'll have things that had symbolic quality now have decorative quality. But as I did the sketch at the bottom of Hera 2, we had Le Corbusier, Gabby, who is doing his sketches of, of the Acropolis. And in looking at this, I see a wonderful thing. I always think of the Acropolis, and I've done some drawing of Arthur and I, and I could bring you. But a lot of Corb's sketches are inside looking out, not just the object. So that artists and architects have filled <coughs> sketchbooks for years with their sketches to understand their world better is my contention. From that understanding, other things can come. This is a little sketch of the interior of Ranchon, which is a wonderful building in southern western France that Corb did on the site of an old of, an, of a previous uh, church that was part of the Mag Maginot Line. It was torn down, they built this. One of the things, those of you that know Ron Shop, you know there's this heavy truncated wall that's very thick. Inside that wall are columns, concrete columns. There's a structure there. Oh, sorry. And then, I did several drawings over on Sean, but my favorite is really the back. It's like when I design a building, usually the back is more interesting than the front. We worry about the front door, but here, the kind of haunches that come around and the, and the towers that, that stick up to catch light from three different directions that come into that chapel. The water spout, which catches the water and brings it out to drop it into a container for baptism. The, the uh, pyramid over on the left, which many people have never seen, were, was some of the rubble from the earlier church. So that we begin to understand how it sits on the hill, how it relates to other things on the hill, in the process of drawing. There are several Lake Abusier Khan is probably well known for his drawings, and you see this solid, solid space in Siena. My drawings are uh, a little different. I haven't done that one, but I, I spent some time in Cortona, and the, where I would do this wonderful little Renaissance church that's down the hill, or in Assisi, where you've got the Roman Temple of Minerva, uh, which is far earlier than that Renaissance church. The Apache Chapel, with its skeletal columns, its space, its light, its shadow, and then this sketch, which is really a pull-apart sketch to understand how the dome fits within the inside of the Apache Chapel, with the walkway, covered walkway out. And then here's Cortona looking from the hill down, down the, the pathway I used to walk to the piazza overlooking the plain, the, hill, the Italian hilltop town. In order to understand, in order to translate complex images into simple graphic symbols, the artist has to have a thorough and deep understanding of the form. He has to, she has to have the understanding of the underlying structure. Looking at the, the little chapel near Taos that many artists in the mid 20th century did sketches of, uh, a couple of sketches, that's the first one and then the second one where we begin to look at these buttressing elements that just make great forms in light and shadow. Finally, a painting of the same, where I begin to bring color, and you soon will begin to bring texture into these as I 
try to understand how this magical building comes together and how it sits in its place. I had a, sabbat a couple of sabbaticals look at megalithic sites throughout, uh, well actually starting in France and going up to the, uh, to the Orkneys. And one of the things you know about these megalithic sites are these barrows. And the barrow, for those that you don't know, we see this, but this is really a structure, a structure that for centuries was covered with large stones and dirt. So that the underlying structure for the barrow is, for the burial place, is this stone structure that it then developed into a mound. Uh, here's another sketch of one in, in Ireland. After I had looked at these a number of times, I suddenly started looking at the structures that were around me. Behind the studio out in the country was this mound, mound which the owner had put this post and kind of cross, enigmatic cross thing on it uh, that I did a, a, a painting of, looking at it in relationship to the to the evergreens that are planted behind it in the skies. And look at, uh, obviously George O'Keefe did a number of drawings in her places out in New Mexico. Here's a little sketch of a mound or a mountain, you don't quite know. And Degas sketch of the hills. And this was the early sketch I did of a mound that was beside the road as I was going out to the studio that somebody dumped dirt there and then thrown grass seed on so that in the middle of the winter it was glowing green. And out of that grew the morning mound, which was related to the previous one. Then I began to bring textures and elements into it, which in a way begins to enrich it. The, these, Southeast Alabama dirt is red clay, red clay. And I, I got a, a fire ant mound to loan me some of its red clay for this piece. I, I unfortunately used my hand, which is not exactly the way to get your, your dirt from the fire ant mound. Uh, but I also have, have looked at, at people and how they, their expression, their structure after thinking about the anatomy. Uh, this, this guy, wonderful little short story on him. He, he was the, uh, had, had worked with a woman who lived in Columbus, Georgia, and her mother lived down South Alabama. She had gone by to see her mother one day, and this guy had agreed to come go with her and do something, and came back with her. At lunch that day, I'd gone down and gotten some fried chicken, good southern food, and came back and I picked up this little pamphlet. And the pamphlet was about all the criminals in East Alabama. I had never seen such a thing before. And I was sitting there looking through it. I didn't recognize anybody. Anyway, about through doing the drawing, which later became the painting, and he said, I'm not in there, am I? I, I didn't see him. The woman had, who had brought him said, when he, he, just the sweetest man, he had, when he was a little boy, he always wanted to be a bank robber. <laughs> that was his ambition in life. And so he went to New York. I mean, if you're going to be a bank robber, go to New York. <laughs> and robbed the bank in the bottom of the Empire State Building. Went to prison. And now he came back to Alabama after he got out of prison. I'm not in that, am I? <laughs> and then this is a Mace, the guy who does a lot of the carpentry work out of the studio, who had had some real struggles during, during after Vietnam. And then here's uh, Selena, who I've done many, many drawings, and this is probably the most developed painting of where we begin to see her in space with the chair helping to find the space. With the color, with the intensity, and 
with even the notions, which I think is accurate, of one eye looking down and one eye looking up. Not, and it had a, had a certain richness to it. Did a number of uh, studies based upon drawing from the model, uh, model prints, and then begin develop, begin developing texture on that and color. The, this is something, something that's fascinated me for a while is the notion of trompe l'oeil where a thing looks three-dimensional, it's not three-dimensional. And uh, this is a, a painting with, this is actually a stick on here, which casts shadow, but then the, 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 the line in the middle is on the, on the canvas, it's not coming forward. And just kind of general colors going back and forth with that notion of trompe l'oeil. Others looking at color, texture, and proportion. Looking at how we proportion things, how we work with these kind of wonderful marks that can happen and begin to develop a certain sense of, uh, of depth and then we have the fractured structures that are all around us, whether it's a flower, a violin. This violin was developed in, um, and it is pretty transparent, like it's developed in Scotland. I don't think it ever went into manufacture. Matisse's fractures of her, his cutout sketches. And then a painting of, of plants and how my favorite fight between the red and the green and how the whole thing can get to be activated as we look further and further into what plants can do and what drawings can do. About this time I began adding elements, not just uh, fire ant dirt, but other elements to paintings. And then uh, this painting was done close to the same time that the one in there is. Whereas I found this rectangle and that black stick was stuck on there. And I said, damn, that's good. What did I do with that? There was a few marks here that somebody had made, and maybe I had, that I took and enhanced and began to develop so that it began, began to be something that was more active. And these, these are actually pieces of balsa wood. And cannot a line from the drawing, can it be a piece of balsa wood if we can put it up there the right way? This painting was done right after 9-11. And actually it's a little kinetic. That frame on the left actually slides in and out so as you decide what size and shape and the interaction of the different elements within it. Trompe l'oeil again, and you've seen it in the other room. This was really looking at the forces within the rectangle and doing several drawings, understanding how various forces happen. They come down, they need to be counteracted here, otherwise the whole thing goes off the board and then comes back around. The red again and, and yellow against the blue. Again, a kind of a found surface that I then worked on, added a screen over the top of a stick, and it begins to be kind of active, again playing in some ways with the red and the green. Here, there's a found sheet that had markings left from spraying and finishing paintings that I then took and began to develop somewhat three-dimensional. This is actually a, a thread that comes through is propped up in the air. And other lines and dots that are added for chance, accident, and change.
in order to translate complex images into simple graphic symbols, the artist has to have a thorough and deep understanding of form and structure. The notion has guided me for decades in drawing countless, countless things. And in the drawing, I've come to a greater understanding of the underlying order of things. Art is a way to help people understand the world or to help ourselves understand the world and a way to see how the world changes through your mind. Its function is to show the essence of something. Thank you.